If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Matthew 5, 21 and 22? So first of all, we're going to, number one, study the meaning of these verses. And then number two, we're going to make some application from these verses to marriage. So again, turn to Matthew 5 and beginning at verse 21. Listen as I read. It says, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Jesus spoke these powerful words in the Sermon on the Mount. And so let's look at these verses closely this morning and see what we can learn. Look at that first phrase. It says, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. Well, who are the ancients mentioned in this verse? The ancients mentioned here were the Israelites who were led out of, led out of Egypt by Moses. The Israelites had been in slavery under the harsh pharaohs of Egypt for about 400 years. Moses was called by God to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and bring them to the promised land. And all this happened about 1,300 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. The Pharaoh did not want to let the Israelites go because they were a workforce. They were slaves. But Moses performed many mighty miracles against the Egyptians, which caused the Egyptians to finally set the Israelites free. And I won't go into what those miracles were um, But you can read about that in the Old Testament. The Israelites, they left Egypt. God parted this Red Sea and they crossed the Red Sea. They went out into the wilderness and they came to a mountain. They came to Mount Sinai and they camped at the foot of that mountain. And this is where they were given the Ten Commandments. When God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments, it was a frightening, terrifying experience for the Israelites. In Exodus 19, 17, it says, And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. And so the people were terrified. God was giving them the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, 18. It says, All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. That was the setting. It was at Mount Sinai. Moses received the Ten Commandments. That's where the ancients received the Ten Commandments. Now, of those Ten Commandments, the Sixth Commandment is the one that Jesus is referring to today in our verse. The Sixth Commandment says this, Exodus 20, verse 13, you shall not murder. Some versions say you shall not kill, but murder is actually the more accurate word. The Sixth Commandment prohibits the criminal killing of another person. Our verse starts out by saying, you've heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. The ancients, again, were the Israelites at the foot of Mount Sinai, 1300 years before Christ. The ancients were told you shall not murder. Now, look what comes next in our text. Matthew 5, 21, you've heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. To be liable to the court meant that if you did commit murder, you'd be brought before the court. And if you were found guilty, the court would sentence you. And in the case of murder, the court would sentence you to death. So the first phrase in this verse tells us that the ancients were told, that is the Israelites in the days of Moses were told, you shall not murder. And if you did murder someone, you'd be liable to the court. Now, just to expand on this a bit more. The specific commandment to not murder was given to the Israelites at Mount Sinai in the Ten Commandments. But the moral law against murder dates much earlier than Moses, dates way back. We can go all the way back to the flood. 
After Noah and his family were placed in the ark and God sent a flood, after they were in the ark for many, many days, the, the waters finally receded and the ark came to a rest on dry land. And it was shortly after that that Noah and his family, they exited the ark and God spoke to Noah and his sons. In Genesis 9, 6, God says, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. God made man in his very own image. And so murder is an especially heinous, wicked act. Not only because it's taking the life of another person, but also because it is taking the life of an imager of God. God himself decreed the penalty. God said to Noah, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. In other words, the just penalty for murder is death. So Christian, know this, God's very serious about murder, and there's an application right in front of us before we go any further. Abortion, abortion is prevalent in our culture today, and no matter what words are used to soften the reality of abortion, such as a woman's right, or reproductive health care, and, and so on, whatever words that, that they use to soften it, abortion is the deliberate destruction of a living imager of God. And therefore, abortion is murder. It's a forgivable sin. The blood of Christ can forgive that sin. But let's not minimize how serious of a sin it is by calling it such things as reproductive health care. It's horrific. It's horrific that it ever became legal in our nation and it's that it's still legal in our nation. Someday, I hope that we look back and we, and we look at it like, like nowadays we look at slavery and we say, how could we have ever done that? Hopefully that will be the case with abortion. And just let me say one more thing about this to you young ladies. If, if you ever find yourself in a situation and, and you get pregnant, don't have an abortion no matter what. Some young girls, they, 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 they make some mistakes. They do some things they know better than. They get themselves in a situation where they get pregnant and they think, how, could I, how can I let my mom and dad know? How can I let my church know? How can I do? Well, let, 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 let it be known right now from the pulpit. If that ever happens to you, there's forgiveness in Christ and there's forgiveness in our church and don't have an abortion. Amen? And so the first verse says, you have, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. This verse is straightforward. It simply says it like it is. You've heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. Whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Now, let's look at the next verse. Look at verse 22. Jesus is speaking here. Jesus says, but I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Notice Jesus says these words, but I say to you. Jesus first tells the crowd what the commandment is, given at Mount Sinai about murder, a, a commandment given by God. And then Jesus says, but I say to you. Jesus is taking authority over the commandment given by God at Mount Sinai. How can he do this? God said, thou shalt not murder. And then Jesus comes and says, but I say to you. He can do this because Jesus is the son of God. The Israelites who were sitting on the banks of the Sea of Galilee that day, they weren't just listening to any ordinary preacher. They probably didn't realize it, but they were listening to the very creator of the universe they were listening to Emmanuel, God with us, right before their eyes. Jesus is telling the crowd what this commandment is really about. Now, he didn't change the law. The law still said, you shall not murder. Jesus didn't change that. But instead, he clarified what the Bible really means when it says, you shall not murder. He taught us that there's more to this commandment than the literal outward act of criminally killing someone. Jesus shows us here the root of murder. He shows us the heart behind murder. And he states that that heart attitude behind murder 
is anger. It's a hateful anger. And to have this hateful anger in your heart against someone amounts to murder in the heart. The outward act of murder is obviously a very wicked sin. But the outward act of murder is not all that the Lord looks at. The Lord looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7, God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so the Lord looks at our heart, doesn't he? And murder first starts in the heart. It starts in the heart with a hateful, bitter anger. And so Jesus tells us here that that hateful, bitter anger is the sin of murder in the heart. If you have a hateful, bitter anger towards someone in God's eyes, you're guilty before God's court of murder in your heart. Now, you haven't actually criminally killed someone outwardly, but the Lord's evaluation is that you have murder in your heart. Now, look at the next phrase. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. Jesus now amplifies the law a bit further. He just said, everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. The anger Jesus is talking about is a hateful anger in the heart. It's on the inside. But now Jesus takes it further. Now Jesus talks about actually expressing that anger with words. Now it's coming out. Now there's words. He says, and whoever says to his brother, in other words, words, you good for nothing shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. Before Jesus was talking about anger in the heart, what no one can see except God. Now he's talking about this anger coming out of the heart in the form of words such as you good for nothing. Other versions say, and whoever shall be, say to his brother, Raka shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. Now that's an interesting word. Raka is a Greek word and it means empty. It was an expression of great contempt. According to Jesus, to speak words of contempt to your brother is serious enough to be guilty before the Supreme Court. Again, Jesus is talking about the commandment to not murder. He's clarifying this commandment and showing us that the origin and source of murder is the heart. It's a heart full of hateful, bitter anger. It's a heart that expresses itself in words of contempt. Now let's pause for a moment and ask, what does that word contempt mean? Because that's what this is talking about, contempt. What does it mean? Contempt is the act of despising. Contempt is the act of treating someone as mean, vile, and worthless. To show contempt is to treat someone as if they are beneath consideration, worthless, deserving scorn. It's to be dismissive of someone. To express contempt is a, a serious thing because Jesus said that calling someone raka, that is to express contempt towards someone, is to express a heart attitude of murder. That's the Lord's evaluation. Now, let's look at the next phrase. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. You fool. Those are serious words. It's, a, it's not so much the words as it is the heart behind the words. When someone says you fool and there's a hateful anger and contempt in their heart, Jesus says that person is guilty enough to be sent to the fires of hell. So what is it about those words, you fool? Well, sometimes looking at another translation really does help us to understand what the meaning is. The New Living Translation says it like this, and if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. To curse someone is to literally tell a person in so many words to go to hell. To have a heart that wishes for someone to go to hell. To say words that amount to cursing someone. The Bible says it puts you in danger of hell. When a person says with bitter anger and contempt, you fool, they are in effect cursing someone. They're saying, you are worthy of hell. And again, Jesus said the person with this heart is in danger of hell themselves. In other words, if a person has such a bitterness and anger in their heart that they're cursing someone, condemning someone, they need to examine their heart 
to see if they're even saved themselves. Now, to summarize what Jesus has said about the Sixth Commandment so far, you shall not murder. Jesus showed us that the heart behind murder is a heart filled with hateful anger. And he showed us the expressions that come from that heart, from someone who has murder in their heart. He shows their expressions, two expressions, expressions of contempt, expressions of cursing. Matthew 5, 21, you've heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Now that we've looked at the meaning of these verses, let's go to the second part of this sermon. And make some applications that have to do with marriage. So what do these verses have to do with marriage? Jesus teaches us in these verses that an angry, hateful, bitter heart is the root of murder. And he teaches us that when we express that hate with words of contempt, that expression reveals a heart of murder. And cursing someone shows murder in the heart serious enough to send a person to hell. Let me raise a question. How many marriages are there where couples are harboring hateful bitterness in their hearts towards one another? How many marriages are there where one spouse says to the other, Words of contempt. How many marriages are there where one spouse hatefully curses the other spouse? How many marriages are murdered, so to speak? How many marriages are destroyed by a bitter, hateful heart and words of contempt? It's interesting. When you look at Matthew 5, 21 and 22, the first thing that comes to your mind would not likely be marriage. But yet, of all the places where you would find a hateful, angry heart and words and expressions of contempt, even words of cursing, sadly, marriage may be one of the most common settings where you would find these sinful things. Jesus said, and whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. Raka is simply a word expressing great contempt. It's interesting. The number one predictor of divorce in America, not number two, not number three, number one, number one predictor of divorce in America is when one spouse speaks to the other spouse with contempt. Number one predictor of divorce. And it makes sense. Because speaking words of contempt reveals, according to the evaluation of Jesus, murder in the heart. Now, a person who speaks with contempt may not ever murder someone outwardly. In fact, a person who speaks with contempt may have never even considered what Jesus says about this. But according to Jesus, speaking of words of contempt is a heart of murder. And it will often murder a marriage. Words of contempt can separate the closest of friends. Words of contempt can separate husbands and wives. And so let's look at this even a little more closely. You may not have realized it before, but know this, to hold anger in your heart in God's eyes is murder in the heart. It's what it is. This is the Lord's evaluation. And to express that anger in the heart with words of contempt reveals murder in the heart. Again, you may not have thought about this before, but know that this is God's evaluation, not ours. God does not want us to hold anger in our hearts. and He does not want us to use words of contempt at all. So let's look at how this shows up in a marriage because it is unfortunately very common. When a couple gets married, they usually start out happy. 
But over time, there's disappointments. It's inevitable. No matter how you put it, you have two sinners living together under the same roof in the covenant of marriage. Couples will let each other down. They just will. They will fall short of expectations. And if there's enough disappointment and there's enough conflict over the years, they'll start to harbor anger and bitterness in their heart. And over time, they may start expressing what's in their heart in words and expressions of contempt. And if bad enough, even cursing. And this is, again, unfortunately common in marriages. I, I see it as a biblical counselor. Couples will get angry and they'll get fed up with each other and they will use dismissive language such as, oh, please, spare me. Or some such words. They'll roll their eyes. They'll make noises and hand gestures like, oh. All of those things are expressive of the heart. All of those things show contempt and dismissiveness. All those things say to your spouse, your opinion is beneath my consideration. All of these things can get to the point where they are expressions of despising someone. All these words, all these tones, all these expressions, we can take them and, and make light of them, but according to Jesus, the evaluation by the Lord himself, he says they reveal murder in the heart. Not to be taken lightly, is it? All these things over time slowly murder a marriage. Contempt kills love. Contempt kills intimacy. Contempt kills marriages. Bitter anger separates and destroys the oneness that God calls for between a husband and a wife. Two people can be in a marriage. They can live under the same roof. And that they can be functionally separated. Their sin of murder in their heart, their expressions, their words, their tones of contempt and anger has over time separated them. They're still in the covenant of marriage, but they're functionally separated. In my experience as a biblical counselor, and by God's, by God's grace and mercy, I've had the privilege of being a biblical counselor for many years now. And so this, is, this is my experience. I've seen this. This is really, this is what I've seen. The number one destroyer of marriages is not so much what the problem is. It's the way couples talk to each other about the problem. And so if these things are in your marriage, if these things are in your marriage, what do you need to do? I'm going to give you a list of 10 things, okay? This is more like biblical counseling than preaching this morning. Biblical counselors like to give lists. I'm going to give you a list of 10 things of what you can do if this is in your marriage, okay? So let's, here we go. Number one. Take how you talk to each other seriously. Don't make light of it. Don't make light of it. Don't walk away and think, ah, I'm going to just make light of this. Don't. Jesus doesn't make light of it. He calls expressions of contempt and bitter anger murder in the heart. That's the Lord's evaluation. Number two. If you've gotten into a pattern of harsh, bitter tones, expressions of contempt, and even cursing, you need to go to the Lord and confess your sin and ask for forgiveness. And you need to go to your spouse and confess your sin and ask for forgiveness. Receive the forgiveness of Christ. Receive the forgiveness of your spouse. Go do that. Number three. The next thing you need to do is to resolve, to put away all words and all tones and all expressions that Jesus would call murder in the heart. You need to put that away. Number four, to do this, think of it as making a new boundary. Consider this. If a husband was asked... Do you ever hit your wife when you get angry? Most husbands would emphatically say, no, of course not. Most wives would say the same thing, of course not. What do you think? 
right? Now think about it. If you're so angry with your spouse that you're using words of contempt, and yet in that anger, you're able to say, I have a line I won't cross. I won't hit my spouse. If you're able to draw that boundary and not cross it, even in your anger, that means that you're capable of drawing a boundary and not crossing it, even in your anger. That's what it means. And so the Lord is asking you to draw a new boundary and not cross it. And he gives us that boundary clearly in Ephesians 4.29. Here's the boundary. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. That's the new boundary. No unwholesome words. No unwholesome words. Number five. Turn to the Lord for the strength to obey God's calling in this area. And he'll give it to you. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The Lord will give you the strength to not cross that line. Number six, let this be your motive. You need a motive to do this. Let this be your motive. I mean, one motive would be to save your marriage and to have a happy marriage. But there's a bigger motive than that. Let this be your motive. 2 Corinthians 5, 15. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. The Lord Jesus Christ, he died for you and he died for me. He died for our sins on that cruel cross. And now he's asking us, in light of that, in light of that he died for us to save us, he's asking us to live for him. And so let the motive to change your words and to change your heart be to live for Jesus. That's a motive, isn't it? Amen. Let that be your motive. Amen. Number seven, with God's help truly from your heart, put on a new attitude towards your wife. Put a new attitude towards your husband. Philippians 2, 3, here it is. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Husbands, look at your wives and say, she's more important than me. And wives, look at your husbands and say, he's more important than me. Number eight, we're getting there. You guys, this is like a mass counseling session more than a preaching sermon, isn't it? Number eight. Restore the love in your marriage. Restore the love in your marriage. And here's how. Restore the love in your marriage by putting off anger and expressions of contempt. They're marriage killers. And replace it by putting on kindness in the truest sense of the word. Remember, last week we looked at this. The definition of kindness is that temper or disposition that delights in contributing to the happiness of others. It's a, it's a temper, it's a disposition that delights in contributing to the happiness of others. Put on that kindness. Number nine. Number nine. Realize what God wants in your marriage. Here's what God wants. Genesis 2.24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. God doesn't want separation of marriage. He doesn't want two people separated. Even if they're in the covenant of marriage under the same roof, he doesn't want them functionally separated. He wants them to be one. And so put off any hard attitude of anger and bitterness. Put off all expressions of contempt. Put off any hateful cursing. And renew yourself in the spirit of your mind to follow Jesus Christ seriously. And put on kindness and love and humility and gentleness to promote oneness. And number 10, choose joy. Choose joy. Amen. Choose joy in your marriage. Make the choice. We're going to have a joyful marriage. Amen? Amen? Let me conclude by saying that we all have heard of adultery in the heart right? I mean, we've all heard of that, right? And, and, and we know Jesus 
Jesus is the one who says we commit, uh, we can commit adultery in our heart. How often do we think about murder in the heart? But Jesus is the one who said that we can commit murder in the heart. It comes from the Lord, same as adultery in the heart. And sadly, one of the most common places where this is seen is between married couples in their angry hearts and expressions of contempt. I, I know I've, I've, I'm, this is pointing at me, too. I wish that someone would have drilled this into my brain 40 years ago, for real. Take this seriously. Take this seriously. Don't walk out of here today. Please don't walk out of here today and think, okay, just go on with your day. Seriously, would you meditate on this? Would you think about this? All the divorces in America, number one predictor, contempt. All the unhappy marriages that even stay together, number one predictor, words of contempt, anger in the heart. Confess it as a sin because it is. Put it away. Choose joy. Do it because you love the Lord Jesus. Look at your marriage and think, you know, how many more years does the Lord have me on this earth? I'm going to stand before the Lord, and I'm going to give an account for my marriage. Time to, time to do something maybe in some of our marriages, huh? Put on kindness. Put on love. Put on gentleness. Put on humility. Know that the Lord wants you to be one. Choose joy. If you need to go to your spouse and ask for forgiveness, do it. May we see hateful anger and words of contempt just the same way that Jesus sees them. You know, Jerry Bridges wrote a book on uh, acceptable sins. I forget the exact name of it. Uh, sins that we kind of take lightly. This would be one of them where we just talk to our spouse any old way we feel like it. That'd be one of the sins we just sort of Jesus evaluates that differently than we have. He calls it murder in the heart. Let's resolve to change that, amen? amen? For the sake of Jesus, put on love and kindness and humility with the motive to glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we could be here today. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you just open our eyes and just hit us with the truth. Lord, that things that we perhaps have not made a big deal of, Lord, you show us, you show us in your word today that you call it murder in the heart. And so, Lord, we pray that you would really help us to take this seriously because you're serious about it. I pray for myself. I pray for this congregation. I pray each one of us would treat our spouses in the way you want us to, Lord. Lord, help us to put off any unkindness, any words of contempt, any bitterness and hatefulness in our hearts. Lord, give us the love of Christ, and may it just shine out to those whom we love and to our, to our husbands, to our wives. Father, bless, bless us now as we leave. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.